uh, record this lecture and post it on the CoLab site for those that would like to come back to my remarks either as uh, in preparation for the final papers that you have for the class or in the future when you're writing your own primary research papers down the road. Uh, for those that are actively enrolled in the class right now, uh, I said this the previous time, uh, but to reiterate, today and next class in contrast to all the others, I'll not be keeping track of everyone's participation and things. This is gonna be more of a didactic format. Nonetheless, I'll encourage uh, you all to raise your hand, and ask me questions uh, midstream along, along the way, uh, if you have them. All right. The elements of technical writing and just writing in general, I wanted to uh, start off with some of the similarities and some of where the differences are. In fact, the, among all forms of writing, the uh, type of written communication that I think has the strongest similarities with technical writing is not uh, creative writing, but instead poetry. And why is that? Uh, both technical writing and poetry have a lot heavily emphasize the structure. And what I mean by the structure is the fundamental units of information that you're trying to uh, convey to an audience. They both also share organization. And so how those fundamental units of information are arranged in sequence for the reader to experience. In poetry, those fundamental units of information might be a rhyme or a verse or a stanza. Uh, for technical writing, these are results, statistics, analysis, but the themes recur. And the third commonality between technical writing and poetry is expectation. This is one that may not be obvious uh, to people that are beginning readers or haven't done too much uh, writing. Just like in poetry, if you're going on and there's a pentameter or there's consonant rhymes or other types of schemes, you get in a rhythm and you expect that type of pattern to recur for the rest of the writing. There are similar types of expectation in technical writing. And when the written document violates those expectations, it is jolting for the audience. Sometimes that can be used effectively, but more often than not, it's a bad type of uh, jolting because it makes it more difficult uh, for the reader to follow along. Now, at a higher level, uh, both creative writing and technical writing give the writer an opportunity to show creativity and also show brilliance. There can be papers that, if you appreciate it, um, do an amazing job navigating through difficult topics in, a, in a, an accessible way, uh, interpreting results in a concise format that's very easily digestible. And uh, I'll try to remind you all to start getting an eye, getting an ear for those effective strategies as you're reading papers now and in the future, because they can, um, you can adopt those types of strategies in your own writing going forward. And then the last thing is um, for both creative writing and technical writing, knowing the rules is really, really important. Knowing how structure, organization, expectation relate to uh, one another. If you don't have that background information, it's hard to be able to exploit them, utilize them effectively in your own writing. And this is where creative writing and technical writing differ very profoundly. The, the rules for technical writing and information graphics, the types of things that I'll talk about in the next class, are very, very different from the rules of creative writing and painting or the type of uh, visual displays. Let's begin with the, what I call this, the standard anatomy of a paper. You may have heard this acronym in other settings. This is the uh, elements of a paper that have stood the test of time over many centuries as an effective mean to communicate 
science. What does the acronym stand for? It's the basic elements that we're all familiar with. Introduction, methods, results, and that's where the A comes from, discussion. And um, these, this format over many centuries has proven its mettle to communicate what I'll call yards of science. And so this is my one joke slide here for the, nobody went on spring break or if you went on spring break, you didn't come back to this, uh, uh, this year. Uh, but it, the geometric analogy is with these yards of beer that you might see in Cancun or when people are on vacation. And how does that relate to the MRAD format? Well, I want, I want you to conceptualize a paper in two dimensions that are perpendicular to one another. On the x-axis or in the x-dimension here, we'll have what I'll call scientific breadth. And then on the y-axis, we'll have what I'll call scientific depth. A paper relates the introduction, the results, and the discussion as follows. The intro, and more to say on this in a couple of slides, seeks to start relatively broadly and draw in an audience as it moves deeper scientifically into the work that will be presented in the results. The results are the, really the core of the paper. They, by definition, are going to be very detailed and so not incredibly broad, and they should go deeply in the scientific topic that they're trying to communicate. After going through the results, the paper should broaden out again and add depth to the overall communication by contextualizing those results, interpreting them in the broader meaning of science as a whole. So we bring the audience in, go down deep, and then broaden out at the end, all together getting deeper and deeper as we go into the science and the message that um, we seek to relay to the audience. Papers that look like this don't get published. And so if it's broad, 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 it kind of doesn't, it doesn't winnow in on anything, there's no takeaway there. And then papers that look like this don't get cited because they're so narrow, hardly anybody reads them, and then no one's gonna be able to draw upon them if no one reads them, they will use them in future, uh, future work. Now the previous slide spoke to the anatomy of a paper what I want to talk to here is about the preparation of a manuscript. So I have my own acronym here, which we'll call FRIDA. And this is the order in which I, in, in, in my lab, and having written many dozens of manuscripts over the year, I found is the most effective way to assemble a manuscript from nothing, no words on paper, just the results in hand, into a final document that we can be satisfied with and can be very readable and accessible in the MRAD format. In this sequence, we start with the figures and the associated figure captions. That's the data that is, the, um, those are the observations, the elements, data elements that we want the readers to be able to take away from, from the work. With figures and captions in hand, the next logical place to begin the proper portion of, of writing is in the results. Then based on our writing of the results, it's usually easier then to craft out an introduction and an associated discussion. And then at the end, we'll write the abstract. Please note, that that order is almost exactly the reverse of what the MRAD format just talked about. So we finish with the beginning, we kind of start in the middle and fan our way outward, forwards and backwards, and then we declare ourselves done. And for those that um, haven't done very much manuscript writing, it can be very disconcerting to work on a document in this seemingly fragmented and non-sequential manner. But in fact, there is a sequence, it's just the sequence of preparation is distinct from the sequence that a reader uh, follows it from beginning to end. And for those in the class, you've already been given redacted figures and figure captions of a paper. 
And so you all will be starting from step two and working your way down. What I'll do now over the next several slides is zoom in on each one of those elements in the Frida uh, sequence to say a bit more about um, what are the considerations and putting the writing together. How do I concisely uh, just summarize, describe the figures, uh, motion of the figures, and again, more to come on this next class. We view figures as a visual presentation of the data. Presenting the data is not the same as simply showing it. Showing it, uh, if you will, just means like barfing a whole bunch of stuff onto the page and having the, the reader or viewer try to figure out what it is. A presentation tries to take into consideration the reader's perspective and display that information in a, in a way that empowers the reader and also uh, enables them to do as little work as possible to navigate the data and the information that you're trying to relay in the figure. Simple but difficult to accomplish goal is to have a figure that is self-explanatory and rich in information. That's a, there's a juxtaposition there because this obviously simpler figures will be easier to self-explain, but the simpler figures, if they're hiding elements of the data or selectively showing the things for simplicity, don't empower the reader to make the evaluation as to whether or not the, the results support the interpretations and conclusions of the author. And so there's this tension between showing as much as you can, but presenting it in such a way the reader is able to in interpret it. And as I said, more to come on my next, uh, the next lecture, which will be on information design. Move on to the figure legend. Concise definition for fig figure le legends uh, is, you can think of them as captions for the visual information relayed in the figure itself. You can view them as providing support for the figure that accompanies them, but they should not be viewed as a crutch for a badly designed figure. And, and in fact, a good test for this is to look to see how far an audience can get with just the figures alone without any captions. And then the captions provide support. You can think of them like uh, closed captioning, for example, for the hearing impaired, hearing impaired person, can usually figure out what's going on roughly from the visual elements alone, but the captioning helps relay additional information to get the full picture of the story that's trying to be relayed. Additionally, uh, captions can and often do provide additional details as part of this, the support. That would be too cumbersome to include in, a, in a, an actual figure. As an example, we've done papers on epidermal growth factor. If we had cells with or without epidermal growth factor, we might just write EGF in the figure legend as a shorthand for what it is. But in the caption, we may specify exactly what does EGF mean in that legend, how much, how long, and then what's being shown or the experiment that was, was done to give rise to the result that's shown in the figure. With figures and figure captions, the next place to, to move in for the, if you will, the real, the real writing element um, is the results. How to define results? Uh, the most precise wording that I've been able to come up with is a textual narration of the data. Narration is not the same as an enumeration of the data. Perhaps some of the people that are uh, on this call might have heard people say, well, you talk about the data and the results, and then you say what it means, the data mean in the discussion. Don't do this. It's a misperception and is easily uh, misconstrued in a way that convolutes what the results and the discussion section are in a paper. I'll have more to say on this. The reason why the results is a good place to start, and it's a good place to start for beginning writers, is because the results section, among all of the others, 
has the strongest modular element to it. You can break it down paragraph by paragraph. And we'll talk about a couple of examples of this uh, in just a moment. Uh, and it can kind of flow as one module to the, to the next one. And so it's not as daunting as something like an introduction or a discussion that have a more unstructured aspect to them. And when we're talking about structure, organization, and expectation, I want to remind what, are the, what is the result? It's an organization of paragraphs or an organization of subsections that themselves are organizations of paragraphs. And paragraphs are organizations of sentences. I, I, I don't mean to be too patronizing. You go back to elementary school grammar and, and writing, but it's been so long, and especially people that are in STEM fields, that English gets a short shrift, and we forget about how to structure sentences uh, effectively. Sentences are organizations of words. And so it all comes down to the words and the order in which they're arranged into sentences, those sentences and the order in which they're arranged in paragraphs, and then those paragraphs, the order in which they are arranged in the subheadings or in a result section overall. Speak more about what effective paragraph structure is. To break this down, say aloud the things that some of your advisors may have picked up by osmosis over, over the years. And get it out in the open so you can think about these things. There are rules, there are um, expected places for things. Uh, and you can see them most clearly in a results text. We begin paragraphs with topic sentences. Topic sentences, the sentence that starts off the paragraph, must be strong. Probably should put strong in quotation marks here because I'm not going to tell you what, a, I'll tell you what a strong sentence is and strong writing is in just a moment. What does the topic sentence do? It can serve a number of functions, and the examples that we'll talk about today are a few instances uh, of them. In the setting of technical writing and a result section, often the topic sentence speaks to what the authors were trying to learn or exclude. Alternatively, in, a, in the most flexible format, they could simply start off with a new topic and the paragraph break and the indentation of that paragraph break cues in the, the reader that it's now, now for something different, now for something perhaps completely different, and it's cued in by the position, first position of the paragraph. Now, occasionally there are two topics that may be separate topics and warrant separate paragraphs, uh, but they're related to one another. Thus, there can also be examples of topic sentences serving a bridging role to bring together two different topics, two different paragraphs under a common, common heading. Those are some examples of the topic sentence. The body of the paragraph, comprised of body sentences, these don't have to be as strong as a topic sentence. And why? Part of it is the information that they're relaying. You know, speak about how the experiments were done or the modeling or simulation or analysis was done. They'll describe the result that was observed from those experiments or those simulations. They'll work back and forth between what's being shown in the figures uh, and then words of um, what things the reader should be paying attention to in those figures. And those can be, can vary back and forth and um, can kind of move along. There can be a, a quite a large number of body sentences before coming to the end of a paragraph. The end of the paragraph is marked by the concluding sentence. And like the topic sentence, the concluding sentence must be strong. Among these three types of sentences in a paragraph, at least in, in my experience as a writer and as my experience as an editor, it's the concluding sentences that are the hardest to write. Just because they're hard to write, doesn't mean that you can ignore doing them because it, if there's not one there, the reader is, is left off a cliff, almost with an arbitrary paragraph break 
no rounding out of the topic and no reset to prepare for the next topic that's going to come up in the following paragraph. And so I can't emphasize enough the importance of concluding sentences to round out a paragraph and then start uh, a new one. And we'll give some examples in just a moment. Usually the concluding sentence in a result section makes a, an overarching statement of what was learned from the results that had just been described in those body sentences. Concluding sentences in an introduction and a conclusion can uh, accomplish other, other things, but you still need to conclude the paragraphs in those sections uh, also. It's just the easiest to give you examples of these in the results because they, they follow that modular form. Before we go into some of the examples with the results, I want to talk about strong writing. I said topic sentences and concluding sentences need to be strong. What does that mean? Strong writing is a couple things. First and foremost, short. Use fewer words. You want to convey the message that you need to introduce a topic or to reach a conclusion in as few words as possible. And there's tension with this because it's our inclination to qualify and be very careful and what we think as precise in the meaning because it's only for a limited uh, regime and only under these conditions, all these things. All of these other pieces end up confusing the message from a reader's standpoint. And so to the extent that you can be accurate and true to the topic that you're introducing or the conclusion that you're trying to make, say it in as few words as you possibly can. Strong writing is also simple. And what simple writing means is declarative sentences that put subjects next to verbs. Subjects next to verbs. Whatever the action is that's doing the action, as close in physical proximity to the verb that's doing the action in the, in the sentence. Technical writing and unclear technical writing is often plagued by massive separations of the subject and the verb, so much so that it's not uncommon for the writer to conjugate the verb incorrectly because they've forgotten what the subject is of the, of the sentence. So keep an eye on that in your, in your writing. And then a third element of strong writing, and this is one that was real transformative to me in the um, technical writing packet that I provided you all, the zip folder, different literature on writing that I've, I've come across over the years. There's an article by Gopen and Swan that was um, very important for me when I came across it in graduate school because it spoke to the importance of how to logically arrange sentences in technical writing from the perspective of old information and new information. Old information is the information that the reader has already been exposed to based on the things that they've read up to that point in the document. New information is the stuff they haven't seen yet, but will become old information as they move farther along into the text. You wanna put the old information early in a, in a sentence, or early in pretty much any sentence, and then the new information later in the sentence, afterwards. After that sentence has been read or has been written, the new information becomes old information and can be used to leverage the next sentence and you bridge sentences along the way. And I'll have some examples of that in a moment, or maybe I, I should say at the end of the, the, the lecture today. The additional component of strong writing is that it should be accurate. The ambiguous statements, a lot of qualifiers, some of this is an effort it's like a feigned effort to be accurate. And really what it is, is the writer being afraid to say something. Uh, and then what ends up happening is that you end up saying nothing because you've qualified everything and send it in such an ambiguous way that you, nobody can discern anything from the sentence. And then the, the fifth element of strong writing is that what's said shortly and simply, logically and accurately as possi possible has meaning to it. There's something that the audience can take away as a result of reading it. It was worth their time to read that sentence. And the, the bar for me to assess meaning 
when I'm either reading a paper or writing one is I ask myself, could the converse of whatever was just said or whatever I just read or wrote, could it plausibly be true? If the converse can never be true, you said nothing in the sentence. You just said a bunch of words, but then if there's no counterpoint to, the, to that argument that somebody would believe, it wasn't worth saying, or it's definitely not saying, worth saying in the way that was, was written in the document in its current form. So you prune, make it shorter, really figure out what you can say assertively with the idea being that's what the reader can take away. What we'll do now is we'll go through, uh, yes, Jaws Rose, I see a hand raised, you have a question. I just had a, um, I was wondering, what is your take on using the uh, active voice versus the passive voice? Yes, okay, that's a great question. And so for, uh, to get everybody up to speed, active voice is using first, second person, first, second, third person subjects in your sentence. If we investigated the following to accomplish this, we did this, that, and the other. Passive voice flips it around and it talks about what things were done, what things were observed. Um, and you can see none of those sentences that I just said had I, we, you, they, et cetera, in, in them. In general, my recommendation is to be active because it's more engaging a writing style. Editors at leading journals tend to expect it. However, that's not a hard and fast rule. Where are the places where I will deviate from that rule? First is the, uh, there are instances, I was just talking about new information and old information. There are some instances where passive voice enables you to put old information earlier in a sentence than would otherwise be possible if you use the active voice. And so when you have an active voice, you're usually leading with I, we, you, they, and not saying what, to, what, you know, what was done. Uh, and so occasionally inverting sentences and using a passive voice can be beneficial in that, in that setting. That's one that comes to mind. And then the other one where we will mostly use passive voice is in the method section because they're often written in such a way that procedurally you want to talk about how the experiments were done with the idea being that you're, you're writing up almost with like methods in enough detail such that someone else can go in and put themselves into that writing and do the same, do the same thing. But I've read methods sections that are really active also, and it's not, I wouldn't say that that's, that's bad form. Were there any other questions? I saw something bouncing on my Zoom here. I have a question. Okay. Uh, I have two questions, actually. The first one, um, I wasn't, I was kind of confused about one when you said, like, as for being meaningful. Um, so the sentence, the converse has, if the converse is actually, uh, like not referable, then it's not a meaningful sentence. Is that what you mean? Yeah. If you, it, 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 let's just give it an example. You know, um, these results suggest that X might possibly regulate Y under certain circumstances in vitro. Like I don't, it doesn't even matter what the identity of X and Y are. Of course, something could always possibly do something under some particular circumstance. So the negative of that, like the converse may say that something could never possibly do this under any given, you know, any possible circumstance is not, is not really realistic. Uh, and, and so where I'll see this sometimes, I'll in fact see this often in, you know, computational theory, data science type of, uh, writing where people are being very hesitant about what the results actually uh, mean and they hedge and hedge and qualify and then they end up saying nothing. It's much more effective to cordon off, to circumscribe, to restrict the sta statement of what you can say 
but say it in an, asser in an assertive way. So say it that it's out there and that you could be wrong. Right? That, that basically what it is, is, is like, could you be wrong? Uh, and that's the, the converse being, being true. I think getting, uh, getting over the fear of being, being wrong, um, at least for, for me, helps refine my strategy for these types of strong sentences. You had question number two. Yes, this. That makes sense. Uh, the other question is more like a, a comment, I guess. Like a lot of us are writing uh, grants or proposals, mm -hmm. and this is more like a technical writing in the sense of writing an actual paper. So when we are to propose something and write aims, um, how can we take the points that you made here and then transfer that over to when you're trying to write something like a proposal? Terrific. Just give me one minute because I realized that the uh, PDF that I wanted to have open, I updated it. And so it's a little bit different. I just wanted to get it back up before I address that point here. Um, give me a second. Okay, so Kate, your question is, with this whole exercise in the class is about writing a paper, but most of you all, if you're year one, year two, or things, you're mostly focused on writing proposals and writing, and writing grants. Um, how do these things pour it over? A lot of them do. Everything that I just said about strong writing, everything that I said about paragraph structure, verbatim is exactly the same in a, in a proposal. Clear, clear writing is context independent. And the, what you want to have in a, in a grant, you want that same clarity. Uh, first place is like, if you have anything related to preliminary results, if you have a preliminary results section or a rationale for an aim that's being presented in a results type of format, you can almost exactly iterate these things that I'm talking about for a results section. And in fact, getting back to the, the, the point I was making before about expectation, from a, a reviewer standpoint, the more that that rationale and preliminary results for a grant looks like results, the, your, what you're messaging to them is that like, you feel this is already ready enough to publish, right? It's, it's, it looks almost in manuscript form, at least from the results uh, standpoint. And, so from the, the, the reader's perspective, that illustrates a, a maturity of those preliminary results. Because they're like, ah, oh, this looks like it's already manuscript worthy. Um, one of the places that, and actually, I only learned this. I only learned this after having read a grant where, um, so that was about, let's say, the rationale for different aims. The, the background section of a grant will be more thematic to some of the introduction that I'm gonna talk about in, in a few, mo few moments. Uh, the one place that is rather grant specific, which I've only been able to wrap my head around, let's say over the last five years or so, is the approach. So the, the approach section where you talk about what you're, what you're proposing to do, the activities over the part of, during the portion of the aim. Early on when I was writing grants, I, I, I tended to map those towards a materials and methods section. And that's boring to read and not fun to evaluate. And yet people still write it in that way. I've had much better success. You want to give details about what you're proposing to do. But what I found is a much more engaging style. And again, I'll, I'll say I pushed this from a grant that I reviewed and I really like the approach is you can start off those topic sentences almost exactly the same way. As, as what I'm going to describe here. What do you, what's the next thing that you're in part of your plan for the aim? And then you walk through the things that you were going to do, right? And so, and so the experimental aspects would go in through there. But the key thing, which I always got hung up from until I saw this and I liked it, is how do you conclude those paragraphs? And the way that you conclude those paragraphs, which I try to do now in all the grants that I, I submit, is you write a concluding like sentence, like the ones that we're going to talk about here that I just mentioned in the, in the preceding slides that says what you what will those experiments yield what will you get out of those experiments what will the conclusion what will the conclusion you as the investigator will be able to reach as a result of doing those activities that are described in the body of the paragraph but all of the other notions like modularity and the expectation 
and the organization. There'd be some other things to say with regard to, let's say, an AIMS page, which it's, its own you know, beast in itself in a, in a one-page format. But the body of the writing um, is, is really not all that, all that different. I put a paragraph in a grant or I put a paragraph into a manuscript, my mentality is, is exactly the same. And these are the things I'm trying to relate to you today. Any follow on questions? If not, uh, I'm gonna have changed now. Oh, let me see, I can do this. If for those that might not have seen the, um, I think this will work. Nope, hold on. I'm gonna, I'll put a link in for this handout on the chat window. The link. So if you don't have this at the ready, there you go, you can link to it, uh, to it there. Um, but this is just a handout um, provided to give a couple of examples of results paragraphs that I've excerpted from the citations that are here. So these are, you know, um, I, I took them as good exemplars of the structural expectation of a results paragraph that I was just describing. So first one here from Michael Karn's group, paper from a number of years ago. He has a tendency to write in a very modular style all the way through the results section. So I got to pull out any paragraph from his results and it would read, read this way. Let me give you 30 seconds to just read the, the paragraph here. Uh, before I, I pause for a moment, what I've done is I didn't just cut out the paragraph. I cut out the paragraph and then broke it down in terms of individual sentences with carriage returns in between each one of the individual sentences. And I did that because, um, and I in fact do this in my own writing. If anyone who's worked on me with a manuscript before and wants to spy on a Google Doc when I'm working on it, I write out the sentences this way one at a time and separate it because in, for me, it's very helpful to um, emphasize the big leap that's taking place when you go from the end of one sentence to the beginning of the next one. And it reinforces to me the need to conform to that old information, new information uh, rule as I'm working my way through the, the paragraph. The third benefit to writing in this way, I mean, this is just a matter of like how you put the words on, onto your uh, processing document. Um, is that at least it's easier for me to zoom in on any individual sentence and take it out of the context of the paragraph and ask myself if it conveys any meaning. Is it informative on its own or is it linked to some other thing in the, sen in, in the paragraph, uh, creating an interdependency there, which I, I don't want to say it's prohibitive, but if like you can't understand most of the sentences in a paragraph, if you, unless you read the entire paragraph, that's not clear writing from a technical standpoint. And the reason is purely pragmatic. First, people's attention spans are finite and these days they're especially short. And second, everybody's really busy and tired. And so more often than not, I'm reading a grant or I'm reading a manuscript when I'm exhausted. And I might fade out for a sentence or somebody, you know, the phone rings or something vibrates or blings nearby me. I turn away and then I come back. I should be able to come back to exactly where I started, not have to read the whole rest of the paragraph before to figure out what, what happened. Um, and, and so, for, at least for me, writing, writing paragraphs, the elements of a paragraph in this way, emphasize a style that is um, autonomously informative. And then when you, when you stitch it all back together as a paragraph, it's, it's usually very understandable and very easy to go in and out of it from the, from the reader's standpoint. All right, I've spoken too much already. Let's pause for um, 30 seconds or so just to read the elements of, of this paragraph and then I'll annotate it uh, with some comments.
all right, I no longer have the luxury of being able to see when everybody puts their head up after reading the document, but I'll assume that everyone has read through this first paragraph. Let me comment on it. Topic sentence. The first phrase of this topic sentence does exactly what I was giving as one example in, a, in the results section on topic sentence. What is the purpose of the experiments that are to follow? Stated right here, trying to evaluate how uh, this protein Sester2 modulates this GTP binding protein called RIP. In this topic sentence, this now flows right into a body-like sentence. So really the topic phrase is just the first phrase here. The rest, it goes right into a body type of description of what was done. Control experiments. Methods. Not belabor the methods, but you don't want the reader to have to go back to the methods section to figure out what the heck happened in the results that are, are about to be described. So these concise summaries of experiments and how they were done should be in the result. Here's the observation, figure citation, a description of the key finding, and then here's the concluding sentence. Less than one line, they say what they suggest. If you think it's if you can make a stronger conclusion, you can say what they, what they indicate. If you're not that brave, you can raise the possibility of something, but you need to say something like what you have here, that, that Sestrin 2 is a negative regulator of the GTP loaded form of RIP. And if you were to go to this paper, you'll see a carbon copy of this structure all the way through the results section of this paper. Let's move on to the next example. This one is from uh, Martin Schwartz's group. It's, it's regrettable. We used to have some really great writers at UVA, like Hemingway type of terse prose, but they've all moved on to greener pastures. But this one is from Martin Schwartz when he was, uh, when he was here on uh, SARC, SARC signaling. We'll give another 30 seconds. Okay, this one reads a little bit different. Here's an example of a topic sentence introducing a truly a new topic. I'm gonna pull this paragraph out of the paper. We don't know anything except for this topic, but all, uh, this topic sentence. But already we as a reader know it's gonna have, have something to do with sheer stress and the activation of the SARC non-receptor tyrosine kinase, literature founded, and I presume that it's fast because it happens within seconds. Next, what was done? We're gonna use these antibodies against SARC. What was the, uh, op, uh, th this is uh, bringing in together with it the methods, right? So these phosphorylation sites indicating activation. What does it show? Activation of it by this flow experiment shown in the supplement. Midline conclusion, shorter but not, not rounding out the entire paragraph, only interpreting locally what this supplementary result is indicating. Some control experiments here, much along the lines of what we were describing in the preceding example. And then cues such as therefore, get the reader, this is an example of that expectation, get the reader ready that a concluding sentence is going to follow. And then here's the statement, just about one line. So a different example of a modular results paragraph, but with the same categories of elements uh, with them. Last example is from Yim Carr's group. And I have two paragraphs here and I don't uh, break it out sentence by sentence because I'm including this one as an example of a topic sentence, the one in the second paragraph, as an example of a bridging sentence that's joining these two, uh, two paragraphs. And actually the whole rest of the other paragraph I've, I've chopped off. 
This one's lar longer. I'll give uh, 45 seconds. All right. All right, let's begin with the first topic. Very similar structure like what we had seen in the first example. Interested in the function of this caryophthorin called important alpha. But then also a hybrid with what uh, we saw in the, the example number two, using this first phrase as the topic phrase, as a topic like sentence, and then moving right into some of the experimental methods. Controls, what was done, what was found, leading into the concluding sentence, or the concluding clause, I guess, of this, of this sentence, uh, saying what the local conclusion is from the results that were just described. Look at the next sentence. Old and, well, it's not in the very, very beginning of the sentence, but the whole preceding paragraph was on important alpha. Here we see important alpha, at least in the middle of the sentence. The new topic, the new information that's being introduced in the second paragraph relates to nuclear RAN GTP. There was nothing on RAN GTP in the preceding sentence, but the whole rest of this paragraph is on RAN GTP. And so here you have an example of a first sentence uh, serving that transition role between the important alpha into RAN GTP. And then all the rest of the modular expectations are the same. Right. Okay. I'll come back to this document, but I'll go to the slide, return to the slides now. Having gone through these example paragraphs, uh, one of the things that I'll make a point to mention when uh, working on the results, like we were just describing it, writing your modular paragraphs and thinking about topic sentences and uh, body sentences and concluding sentences, you might find that um, there are certain things that you, you need for that sentence to be, or that paragraph and the results to be informative. Because remember, you're, you're writing this not in the order that the reader will read it. And as an example, that example too, the one on shear stress and SARC activation. You're like, well, I think we need to talk about, the reader's gonna need to know like what shear stress is all about, what the SARC tyrosine kinase is all about. As you're writing, when you come across those things that are important background information for the reader to have, what I found is effective is to take a running list, uh, create a running list while I'm working on the results of material that needs to go into the introduction. We're going to transition now to the introduction, but this is why I'm talking about it here with the results. So you, you um, make an inventory of the things that the reader will need to have seen at the point of the part of the results text that you're writing. And then with that inventory, after the authors have gone through the results section, you can look at those items for the introduction and um, organize, consolidate, critically evaluate which pieces of information does the reader really need. And that creates the raw materials for the next part, which I'm gonna talk about which is for the introduction. There are similar themes like this where you're bulleting and making a running list for the discussion section. And I'll try to remember as best as I can to come back to that when we talk about discussions. 
First, the introduction. What's an introduction? Concisely said, I view it as a scientific framing, or if we use that yard of beer analogy, funneling toward the results. The goal is to draw in an audience and to draw in the audience that you intend. And that intended audience, you want to have them continue on, read the rest of your paper. And that intended audience is a really important one uh, because the tension with an introduction is that the, the funneling here that you're trying to draw in the audience needs to be done efficiently. And efficiency in writing means as conveying what you need to do, accomplishing what you want to accomplish in as few words as possible. So you don't have very much real estate in an introduction to bring in just the right readers for the paper and the depth of study that you're going to show in, in the results. So it's like one of those um, carnival games that you see. It's like a funnel or a plate or something. You've got to throw a coin in there and you try to get it to go into the, into the tube. Those coins or those raindrops and a funnel outside uh, are your readership. And the intro is trying to bring them in to go into the tube, which is your results. If an introduction is way broader than is appropriate given the results that are shown, you're going to lose a lot of people and it, before they even get started. Yes, they may look at the, the, they may start reading the intro, they may see the title or however, but once they start getting into it, they'll be like, this is not for me. This is akin to trying to do one of those carnival games where you have a plate, like a flat plate. Most of them are going to end up bouncing, bouncing off because uh, attention spans are short and, and things, and I quickly diagnose it as not of interest to them. If the intro bike on the other end of the extreme is too narrow, they just don't even get into the tube. It's like not even having the funnel at all. I try to get hope that people go right into where, where you are. Uh, and, and that's a drawback because yes, you may uh, draw the interest of your competitor or some other people that are doing exactly the same thing as you, but you'd hope to have a broader impact than simply the people that are already of the same mindset as you. Therefore, there's a decision to be made about who else are you trying to bring in? And that decision is dictated by um, the results that you have. What's the background information that you're gonna be providing them in that uh, introduction? And how will you be drawing them in to get into the results of, uh, of the paper? Now, the common talking points that are usually relayed in an introduction are as, as follows. Broad categories. Number one, what is the problem and why is it important? Number two, what's been done before? What's the state of the science? What's been known? Number three, what's the new method, approach, idea, finding? key central overarching result here. And then at the very end of that introduction, very briefly, I'm talking about like one sentence to conclude the entire uh, introduction, is what's the overarching conclusion based on the findings. These first three elements should be very familiar with people that are in the class. This is how we kick off every single paper. So knowingly or not, you all have been giving verbal introductions of the papers and the purpose is to warm you up to being comfortable in that format and now implement it, not verbally, uh, but in writing as you go in and craft your introductions for your final papers. And anytime when one of you has talked about an introduction and if you've heard pushback from me, try to get more information or slow you down or do these things. What I've been trying to do is help you steer the pitch of that funnel in words as you're, as you're describing it. So keep that geometric analogy in mind as you work on your final page. Back to the document, I'm gonna show an example introduction. Oh, 
No, I'm not. Let's see. I think I just overwrote the thing that I wanted to here. That was a good idea. Give me one second, I'll find it. This is what I get for updating a file right before class. Give me one second. Oh, my time capsule is being too slow. All right, give me one more second. I think I'm going to find it. Okay, apologies for that. The link that I just sent, I sort of killed that version, but let me, um, here we are. All right, so sorry about that, but I, um, I'll try to keep this open to the extent that I can. We're focusing on the introduction here uh, of this paper. This was a seminal paper from a number of years ago that discovers a calcium release activated calcium channel through two different methods. One is through a uh, phylogeny study, a kinship study in a um, set of siblings and a family with a defect in this channel. And then the other part of the paper is an RNAi screen in Drosophila that converged upon the same gene, which was called a RI, which is the calcium uh, release activated calcium channel. So this group in the introduction is challenged with bringing together functional genetics, signaling, et cetera, along with the clinical disease and uh, translational relevance of the finding. And so with that, high level background, I'm gonna give you two minutes to read just the introduction of this uh, paper. And what I have written here is uh, on, the, on the margins is my perception of the audiences that they're trying to bring in. It's an article from Nature, so it should have broad impact and a lot of people wanna be brought, brought in. Uh, and so look on the margins as you're, as you're reading through this uh, to glean functionally the purpose of each one of those sentences as it's going through. So we'll give a, a minute and a half, two minutes.
Okay. Let's read briefly on some of these annotations. The strategy here for this introduction is to begin with second messenger signaling, calcium physiologists, biologists. This ties into an immunological disorder, a severe combined immunodeficiency disorder. We need to bring in the immunologists. As a second messenger, calcium is also transported by channels. And one of the consequences of calcium-mediated second messenger signaling is the regulation of gene expression. In this introductory paragraph, the conclusion of um, NFAT dephosphorylation and transcription factor activation in the nucleus acts like a concluding sentence. It is the concluding sentence of the paragraph. That's how it rounds out the idea. Next paragraph is geared towards the clinical side of things. So here's talking about the skid defects in these channels and other types of things and how it impacts the uh, clinical severity. So those are the two things that are being brought together, the molecular biology, signaling biology, and then the clinical condition. And then here's the problem statement as the uh, topic sentence for this next background paragraph talking about past work. Like I said before, all past work here. And then the start here, this is the beginning of the new information, the new part, what will be relayed in this paper. Here we, that's an expectation generating uh, uh, starting point for a paragraph that you now see what a uh, glimpse of what the results are in this paper. Bringing together the medical side, the biology side, and then at the end there's an example of a uh, you know, one sentence based conclusion on the findings of this paper. So this was probably one of the more most challenging introductions I could think to, to write, but it's navigated very efficiently in this document. We're ready to move on now to discussions. What does the discussion seek to accomplish? Well, it's meant to provide a broader scientific meaning of the results. The local interpretation of what the results indicate or suggest, that belongs in the results. This broader scientific meaning is what belongs in the discussion. There are journals that permit a fused results and discussion format, not in this class, and generally not ever. It's a crutch for writers who don't know the difference between a results and discussion. Even those that are aware of it, when you read a hybrid results and discussion, it's, it's like neither here, neither here nor there. Um, there's a great benefit to having them completely separate from one another. Even though the discussion, probably for most beginning writers, is the single most difficult section to write. When I was first doing this as a graduate student, I think the best overall advice that I got related to discussions and to avoid the um, pitfall of regurgitating the results is don't cite data figures. If you have a model figure, you know, figure seven, and old cell papers, things like that, you know, cartoon, those are fine to cite. Actually, they should probably be leveraged very heavily if you can have one of those in, in, in your paper. Uh, but don't cite out all of the things that you're saying because you'll fall into that trap of just regurgitating the results. The only exception to that is if you're going to revisit a piece of data in a way that is different from the way that they were presented in the results. If you, if you were presenting the results section in a certain trajectory, and now you wanna come back and look at one piece of the data from a different angle, that'd be appropriate in the discussion section, but otherwise don't cite figures. Expectations for the discussion. Usually the first paragraph of the discussion summarizes the, the overall study as it's laid out in the results. This is especially, um, expected in a long format 
type of paper. If it's a seven figure, you know, big thing or multiple panels, the reader may follow you all the way from start to finish, but then at the end, they may, they're going to need to get a reset about how all the different pieces individually fit together into the broader scheme. Rest of the things I have on this slide are different examples of things that can be brought into a discussion or might arise as you're working your way through the results section. Say, like, oh, this thing is interesting. Well, but if I start talking about it now, it's going to start veering the, the, the writing away from the way I want it to go in a results section, which be going through the figures and the order in which you're, you're, you're showing them. As an example, things such as cross connections between figures something from figure two to figure six often will come across as a diversion to bring them to get to try to interpret them in a, in a deep way. Uh, but those can be fine things to talk about at a high level in a discussion. Also, if there are any um, inconsistencies with say some of those figure cross con connections or if there's something there that um, you think you know what's going on, but it, to go and explain it fully and the results would be very distracting. You can put it in as a discussion point. And if you're going to put it in as a discussion point, be prepared to interpret it deeply rather than to say, like, we don't know what the heck is going on. And part of the way in which you can interpret it deeply is provide an explanation for the findings, leveraging the literature heavily uh, to, as much as you can to reconcile your, your, your findings. So the thing about the discussion from the setting of broader scientific implications, for example, is if there was any research that this study built upon, first that, that work probably needs to be cited and introduced as past work in the introduction, it's fair game to revisit that past work and ask, discuss whether it warrants a reinterpretation. Was there a puzzle out there that, or were there two groups that um, were at odds with one another about what the finding was? And does your uh, result help navigate those two and provide either a vote for one or the other or an explanation that uh, reconciles the two? All of those things are gonna be great discussion points. In addition, future direction, building, if now this is, if this paper now is old information, what will be the new areas of inquiry going forward, future things. That's a fine thing to uh, discuss uh, at the end of a paper. You can even, you can speculate a lot more in a discussion than you can anywhere else in a paper. Uh, and we don't have time to, uh, for me to walk through discussion. These are usually longer, but um, what I will do is point you to places where often good discussions can be found. I won't say that there's a good discussion in every single one of the, the papers, but your best chance of finding good discussions, in my opinion, are in the cell press family of journals because they're in the, a typical seven figure format um, with a properly text allocated to a discussion. And then also the post journals, plus biology paper, um, uh, oftentimes will have very nicely put together uh, discussion sections. Uh, the other thing is, this is probably the best um, place to, to say it, is that when, as you're going forward in your reading, you come across a paper and you find a discussion, this is what's reminding me of it, a discussion that you particularly like, go back and do the reverse engineering and figure out why you like it. What were the strategies that they used to have that be a discussion that was particularly resonant with you? And then use that as a takeaway from the, the paper and say, okay, well, you remember the stuff in the paper, the finding, you like the paper, but there might be a, a writing strategy or a, a skill that was um, demonstrated there that may in fact be even more valuable than in the long run than the, the finding that was communicated in that paper. All right, we're getting to time. Uh, I want to finish up with the abstract. Now, the abstract we can uh, go relatively quickly through because the abstract itself can be viewed pretty much as a miniature version of the paper. Um, and what I was talking about uh, before about reverse engineering and, and things along, along these lines, I'm gonna do this, this is for one of 
a paper from my group, if I can organize it in, in, in different ways. And I'll, it'll enable you to um, see the logic that went into putting things where we put them and why we, we put them in. Okay, so this is the paper, and I'm just going to have, hold, put up the summary here, the abstract of the paper, and I'll give a minute, 45 seconds, because we're running short on time. Okay, let's now take that abstract and break it down in a couple of different ways. The first way, I'm gonna break it down, shown here. It's all the same wording. All I did was just spread out the sentences and, anna and annotate. You don't need to reread them, but what you pay attention to are the annotations. First couple sentences were a mini introduction. This body sentence here, was the methods section. The intervening, was it two sentences, three sentences here, are the results concisely stated. And the concluding sentence acts in many ways like the, the one sentence foray of a discussion, broader implications of what the findings mean. And so in the same way that we dove into each one of these individually, there's a microcosm of each one that is assembled in the abstract. And then the last thing that I'd like to show you is the, uh, this is at a, a finer grain level, the um, organization of words and information within each one of these sentences, adopting that old information, new information connectivity, like what I was describing uh, in the results section speak to a couple of these. So we're going after this journal called Cell Host and Microbe. They'd never really published a paper like this before, so it was kind of a risk associated. So we're like, we better make sure that we, the paper is uh, appropriate for the journal. So let's say they know host, so let's put host in our title. Hopefully we get reviewed. New information was this virus that we were interested in with respect to its host near the end of the title. We hit host again here in the very first sentence. Response is relatively new here, but then we go and we use it as uh, old information later on in the sentence. The paper itself de dealt with signaling pathways. So that came up as relatively new information later in that first sentence. That's now old information. It starts the next sentence, which then splits it down as a measure of signals and downstream responses. You see virus coming up again again here. And then these flow into these downstream type of responses that we want to introduce after we've introduced the notion of cell responses. You see cell signaling come up here again. The one place as I was going in and deconstructing this, we've talked about signals, virus, host cell responses, damage, signaling. The next sentence here is we built a statistical model. This violates those rules that I just said. And it is jarring because we didn't say anything about a statistical model up to this point. It just comes out of nowhere and jolts the reader into now a computational form formalism. Um, and also there's another thing over here talking about phosphor uh, phosphorylation, which we might have been able to leverage sooner rather than later. 
and as, as I was reverse engineering this, I hadn't looked at the paper in a while, I was trying to figure out why we wrote it that way. And in fact, what happened was the editor forced us to change the, the summary sentence in this way. And so they violated, we, we, the original submission conformed to the rules. They editorially revised it to violate those rules. And at that point, we just wanted to get the paper in, so we'd pretty much do whatever they told us. And I'll not belabor all the rest of it, but you can go through and do these, um, the, the arrows and the wiring diagrams here for the rest of the document. If you are willing, and basically the final grade on this assignment is gonna see the extent to which you're willing to, to do this, to reinvent who you are as a writer and think to the best as you can all of these different considerations that I laid out in this lecture uh, today, you can do these types of activities all in your head. Early on, it's really, really hard because you need to reinvent who you are as a writer. The current style that everybody is operating with, you have to um, abandon this notion that it's good enough. It's never good enough. I mean, my writing style is, is good, effective. I get compliments a lot of times for effective presentation and things like that, but I still have a lot to learn. I still always try to um, make improvements. I still try to keep my mind open to learn new things, hopefully that I can incorporate in these lectures down, down the road. And, but the reason why I got to where I am is because as a graduate student, I committed to change, to change who I was as a technical communicator and to learn from others and try to incorporate those. And so what I tried to do today is lay out as clearly as I could think to, to articulate what are these major criteria? What are these things that I juggle around in my head as I formulate a sentence in an abstract, in an introduction, in a result section, in a discussion, so I hope you take elements of that as you go forward and write your own uh, final papers, grants down the road, manuscripts down the road, down the road from there. Uh, and that's all I have to say. Uh, for those that are imminently writing, have a happy time writing, I'll uh, post this video on the CoLab site so you can go back and refer to it in the future. We're done, and I will see you in class, information design lecture next Monday at 3.30. Thank you. Bye-bye.